Hello, and welcome to another episode of Laying Down the Lore, a monthly podcast in which we aim to separate our ghouls from our goblins, our snotlings from our skaven storm fiends, and our bone splitters from our beast claw raiders, and generally ask what's up with this Warhammer stuff. My name is Ben Crone Barber, and I know fuck all about Warhammer. With me is my co host, Christopher Crallen Allen. Bonjour, no. Who also knows fuck all about Warhammer. Very true. And my dear brother Darren. Hello. Who knows so much about Warhammer it's a wonder he has time to do anything else. After gathering online to slay some vermin in the name of Sigmar, this dichotomy between our levels of understanding became clear, and this series is an attempt to address that ignorance. So, Darren, last week we looked at the prehistory of the Warhammer fantasy world, didn't we? That's right, yeah. So we started with the old ones, these mysterious cosmic beings who seem to create and destroy purely for shits and giggles, as far as I can tell. <laughs> then we've got the Slan and the Lizardmen, who the old ones created to do their bidding. Yep. We looked at the orcs and their mental gods, what they call Mork, Mork and Mindy, Mork and Dork. <laughs> Gork and Mork. Gork and Mork. <laughs> <laughs> Then we heard all about the collapse of the Chaos Gates, which unleashed all manner of buggery and tomfoolery into the world. You showed us that really disturbing picture of kind of half goat, half man, half man bear pig. <laughs> there, there's a touch of Albrecht Dürer about it. Yeah. <laughs> there is, isn't there? And then I think we ended on the elves and their king creating that vortex, which stabilized the level of chaos energy in the world and generally made it a little less mental. Is that right? <laughs> that, that's about the long and the short of it, isn't it? Yeah. That's pretty much it, yeah. 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 Well done. You've learned something, Benny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone who's familiar with the, the history of the Warhammer world will pick that apart in frothing rage, but the broad strokes, yes, that's correct. We we'll, <laughs> we deep dive as much as we want in future should episodes. I, but should yeah. I expect hate mail then? Yes, but not for this. Oh, mate, burning hate <laughs> yeah. mail. What do you got for us this week, Darren? Give us a quiz. Put us on the spot. Well, <laughs> this month's episode is just a quiz on the last month's episode. Uh, no, I was saying, do we need like a, a safety word? Like a cut word. <laughs> Marmot. Like pineapples. Marmot. Yeah. Mar Marmaduke. <laughs> Marmaduke. <laughs> Armadillo. Um. Schoffelhofer Hefeweizen. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought before we launch into this month's topic is we'll just have a quick look back at last week and just see if there's anything uh, we glossed over perhaps too lightly or uh, misspoke on or something that came from a, a follow-up from a, a, fact, a listener. Fact checking. Yes, fact checking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so really, I, I had three points. The, the first one was a, a phonetic one. We used the uh, the word Nuffle or the name Nuffle to describe the god of Blood Bowl. Oh, yeah. Um, and that was actually pointed out that it was how you say the letters NFL if you were to speak them as a word. N uh, NFL. Yeah. N Nuffle. 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 Yeah. Nuffle. 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 Yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, the second point that was brought up is that when we briefly discussed, Chris, your experience with Warcraft, we've discovered since we spoke about that, that Warcraft was originally intended to be a Warhammer licensed property. It was going to be um, effectively the world of Warhammer uh, rather than no the world way. of Warcraft. That's I insane. can't even imagine that <laughs> yeah. all, I know, all I, mean, I know is blizzard's fantasy take on fantasy that that you know the warcraft the blizzard warcraft world as it is known now and mm. i don't know if i'm comfortable with that you know <laughs> <laughs> honestly how, how, that, that could have gone wrong you know and there oh, must yeah, be so like, surely if wrong. they so what did they they tried to license uh warhammer before creating the world of warcraft I'm not Is sure right? they got to the point where they where they actually were in discussions with Games Workshop, but it was certainly intended to be a a Warhammer computer game. Wow, because there, I mean, there are like like Chris mentioned last month. There is a lot of parallels. Oh yeah, between the two worlds. If that's the case, they must have been treading on some thin ice in terms of IP and and copyright. Because, mm. but, but then I guess you know the 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 kind of the races of fantasy. Tolkien had them and, you know, they've been talked about in multiple yeah. different 
IPs, as it were, multiple different worlds. They're like Christmas songs. No one owns the rights to Christmas songs, right? Jingle bells and that. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Terrible analogy, but yeah, I'm sticking <laughs> with it. <laughs> but yeah, no one owns orcs and that. Guess when we recorded this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. The, the IP is a, an interesting point because when they moved from Warhammer to Age of Sigmar, a lot of the races were uh, renamed, rebranded with distinct copyrightable names. So um, Games Workshop has moved away from generic elf, orc, dwarf, uh, and now they're using elf, yeah, dwarden, and uruk. Yeah, so they moved in a direction to more rigorously defend their IP. Wow. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah. The third point I want to raise is I said in last month's episode that the world wasn't really defined, uh, the background, the story wasn't really defined until the third edition of Warhammer. And that's partially true. Uh, between the second and third edition, they released Citadel Journals, uh, and that had a lot of background information or the seeds of the background information. In the case of Skaven, that's where Skaven first met the world. It was in a, a Citadel journal. Ah, uh, okay. So these journals were like lore light that kind of came out in between main editions. It's where they kind of brought into the, the marketplace, in quotes, uh, the new ideas together with hobby articles and um, kind of catalogue of miniatures that you could buy. It very much, I very much like I like an annual. This, yeah, I re I remember the magazines when I was much younger. My brother was into painting the figurines, and I remember flicking through endlessly flicking through these like magazines. I don't know exactly what it was, but it sounds like these Citadel. Uh, um, editions. Are you are you getting um, what, yeah. what was what was the name of the other magazine, the other main Games Workshop magazine? Darren White, White Dwarf, White Dwarf. Yeah, you might be Maybe thinking it was of those that. ones. Chris. You can't say that these days. Very hot water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they prefer to be called neutral, vertically <laughs> challenged peoples. Exactly. <laughs> of whiteness. Yeah, and, and that's also a different podcast, so let's kill that. Yeah, this is also the right. second... I mean, this is, you know, we're two episodes in, and that's a joke about vertically challenged people a piece. <laughs> so I just want to I just want to say <laughs> to anyone listening, like, we are not heightist. To all them shorties out there, <laughs> keep on reaching. Chris is, Chris is one of my best friends, and he is tiny. Mate, <laughs> what I lack for in my stature, I more than make up for in my huge personality. All right, then? <laughs> right? Sure, mate. Sure. <laughs> what are you saying? Yeah, like Mary and Pippin. <laughs> and Kralin. <laughs> they cut me out of that film. I was really angry. So you can't have Mary and Pippin without Kralin. <laughs> Fucking they bastards. They left you in the Shire. They couldn't stand three whole films with you <laughs> tagging along, pissing them off. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Darren, let's, uh, what are we talking about today? So this episode, I thought we'd have a, a further delve into what chaos is. If you recall, we discussed the polar gates and the collapse of the polar gates mm. and you saw mm. the horrific effect that the mutating power of the warp or the realm of chaos had on those individuals in that picture and i think we should uh, include that picture again in the show mm, notes for this definitely. episode kind of dive into what it is how it manifests and how it works and what it means in the kind of larger context of the warhammer world chaos is described alternately as either the corrupting power of magic or a plane of negative emotions. So it's a kind of space between spaces that reflects the souls of the beings in Warhammer, in general, leaning towards a negative connotation. So uh, it's we'll the anti-version of that person. So it'll be like, there's Kralin and there's anti-Kralin. There's <laughs> Benny and there's anti-Benny. There's Darren... And there's just Darren. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, I have been described previously as a whole. Um, <laughs> the chasm. So you said mainly negative emotion. Does that yes. mean that some positive emotion goes in there as well? Yes, as it's a reflection of the kind of population of the Warhammer world, it reflects both the good and the bad. Mm. But because life is so incredibly fucking hard in the Warhammer world, 
the bad emotions that are reflected tend to outweigh the good. Right, okay. But with those descriptions, either as magic or negative emotions, I hold the opinion that it's a kind of area of potentiality of spiritual energy, both positive and negative. But don't misunderstand the semantics, as I certainly view it as a corrupting thing rather than a transformative thing. And that kind of touches chaos with a needle. It changes you as an individual, as a kind of a sovereign being in Warhammer. It changes you to reflect the strongest aspect that you have. And in general, it does so through a prism of negativity. Right. So... For example, you could be very clever and wise, and it would accentuate that, but you would be negatively cunning and wise to the detriment of you and your friends? Wisdom uh, equating with knowledge, I know that they're not the same thing. Someone who becomes corrupted by chaos becomes very avaricious for knowledge mm. and will do anything to gain more knowledge. Mm, I see. Um, with this reflection of positive and negative spiritual energy, I sound very much like I'm from the 70s, which I am, <laughs> similar ideas and similar emotions uh, kind of are drawn to each other. And so the spiritual repercussions of a violent act, as reflected in the realm of chaos, is drawn towards another reflection of a violent act. And the same then with an excessive act or an act of despair or an act of uh, transformation which oh, you know, or corruption and as those acts and souls to use the word from the the lore are drawn together they begin to gain again a word i can't say sentience and over the millennia we've seen then that four sentences have come to rule the realm of chaos uh, and those are what have turned into the four chaos gods. And that is Korn, who's the, the god of violence and bloodshed. Uh, Slanesh, who's the god of sexy desire in the original sets of uh, Realm of Chaos books, which if you can get a hold of those books, they're absolutely amazing. But that has been transformed into a more child-friendly... Family-friendly, uh, accessible. Family-friendly mm. uh, god of excess rather than sexual proclivities you've got nurgle then who is the god of despair oh, and, and the sound of nurgle. the flagellants in the bath <laughs> 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 uh, nurgle, of nurgle. despair and disease and then you have zinch who is the god of transformation the god of magic but again also the god of mutation uh, and his followers are always riddled uh, with mutations so the you know these souls come into the the chaos realm they group together based mm -hmm. on their their similarities and then they start to coalesce essentially they start to build something bigger than themselves you know the sum of yes. the parts and they eventually create these things that become known as gods we see them portrayed in particular forms i know corn's always he looks like a demon doesn't he yes is that it or is it a projection of it? Is it still in the warp? Is it manifesting in the real world? I think from the chaos books and from the kind of wider lore, it's how mortals view corn. It's how they view that amalgamation of souls. So he's described as being this enormous bipedal creature with a dog's head carrying an enormous sword which is unusual because most of his followers and some of his demons carry axes the better to cut people's heads off because he's also known as the skull god i think elves would view him slightly differently than humans so i don't think there's a, a true visage of any of the four chaos gods mm. the chaos gods have never shown their faces and been like Ta -da. This, this is what, is what I, I look like. like. If you were to see what they actually looked like, your mind would be flayed away and, you, you know. Uh, so no one who's okay. ever actually seen what they look like has lived long enough to be able to describe what they looked like. When humans or any of the Warhammer races see corn, for example, 
Does that mean he's in the real world and no longer in the warp, or is is he still both? None of the gods ever leave the warp. That's where they exist. Right. I, I don't know if there's any metaphysical reason why they couldn't. Uh, they just simply haven't to this point. So they are it really good where they are. They're like we're the rod rod the gelms or the or the god realms. Yeah. <laughs> rod gelms. We're the god realms. <laughs> we're the rod gelms. Um, <laughs> It's an interesting point because the demons that's associated with them, and, and each god has a demonic pantheon, which is broken into four main areas, but each of those demons is in fact a group of souls Korn has taken from himself, smooshed it around a bit like an angry kid playing with Play-Doh, and threw it into the <laughs> real world, and suddenly you've got a bloodthirster, which is their greater demons. But in fact, it might be a, a good point just to describe what each god's pantheon mm. uh, is made up yeah, of. I was going to ask. As I said, it's four kind of main groups of demons. You've got the greater demons, which are like the commanders and generals of their demonic legions, the lesser demons, which are are the foot soldiers but these are foot soldiers that would wipe out you know a company of, uh, of mortal troops if they went unchallenged and then you've got demonic steeds uh, which are beasts of burden or the mounts and then you've got demonic beasts which are the hunting dogs and the kind of strange looking creatures so for corn we've got the bloodthirsters which are the generals the blood letters, which are the kind of geiger esque looking, lanky, alien style creatures with swords. Mm. For the steeds, we've got juggernauts, which are giant brass dogs, but very much in the kind of brass. mechanical. Buff up real nice. <laughs> real nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can just buff that out. <laughs> Look at the shine on that jugger. You've been using jugger shine. <laughs> <laughs> Buff less, shine more. <laughs> and then you've got the the demonic beasts of corn, which are his flesh hounds, which are a, a kind of cross between a lizard, a lion, and a hyena. Sounds like something a four year old would draw. <laughs> like draw me a draw me an animal. Well, I've got a hyena, a lion, and what, an aardvark or something? You say? <laughs> yeah, a badger. Just a really, really angry badger, a badger. <laughs> that somebody poked with a spoon. Who's to say they're not already demonic creatures, badgers? Jesus oh, Christ. No. But, I mean, th those are, you know, with corn, it's very straightforward. You've got a giant guy with wings in charge. Then you've got weird guys with elongated heads and swords who are the foot soldiers. You've got a, a, a robot dog lion as the steed and then you've got scaly dogs with the dilophosaurus frills that come oh, out yeah, those, uh, yeah, when they're yeah, pissed yeah, off yeah. so that that's corn but i would describe those as the ground level imaginings of what um of a demonic uh, force mm. looks like if you get into zinch the god of uh, magic and manipulation they've got uh, a deck of cards a top hat they can pull stuff out of, <laughs> yeah. an endless ribbon supply yeah. coming out their top. Just loads of rabbits. <laughs> Shitloads of rabbits. Illusions. Well, I've often thought David Blaine had a touch of the demonic about him. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Zinch's greater demon is a Lord of Change, which is an enormous bipedal crow, multi-hued with a long, sinuous neck. There are lesser demons, which are the horrors, which is a, a great creation because it starts as a pink horror. And if you kill it, it bursts into flames and then turns into two blue horrors. And if you kill them? If you kill the blue horrors, it turns into brimstone horrors. And then if you kill the brimstone horrors, that's it. That's wow. the end of that. You finally get to the chocolatey, chocolatey center. <laughs> 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 the final horror is the horror of the Ferrero Rocher horror. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hazelnuts. Yuck. At the center of it is just a tiny piece of paper that has your fortune on it, you know? <laughs> and it includes the word horror. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the demonic steed is what's called a disc of zinch, which is a two meter in diameter, angry, fleshy, cyborg frisbee <laughs> that flies where, where can i buy I'm one of them him now i just what who thought of that <laughs> I'm, I'm googling it right that now. sounds awesome that would that would certainly transform kind of afternoons in the park wouldn't it it is a frisbee with horns on it you won't want to catch <laughs> that so, so that's a living thing is it that's an organism or is it more of a device is it hardware i wouldn't say living but it's an organism okay it has feelings it's aware of itself yeah. Okay. 
because it looks it just looks like a platform with no soul. Like a shit turtle. But anyway, who am I to argue? I'm a mere human being. And then you've got the beasts of Zinch, which are what's called flamers. They look like a three meter tall mushroom whose cap has been replaced by a, a multi mouthed face. And from its two arms, it shoots a uh, magical fire that kind of destroys you on an existential <laughs> level. Do you think there was a board meeting when they make these concepts? They go, right, Zeech, his steed, it can either be a disc, <laughs> a regular horse, <laughs> a big <laughs> elephant, or do they just get some guy to quickly whip this up? Because I'm not saying it was thrown together. <laughs> However, it's a bit of a mishmash <laughs> of things, isn't it? I mean, it's a horror. Maybe that was the whole point. It was like, just yeah. put all the shit together that doesn't work and make it purple and slimy and spiky with lots of eyes and faces. What you've just described there from my memory was the first two of Ben's girlfriends. <laughs> Ho! <laughs> Hello! Hello! Do you dream of rolling white beaches and crystal clear waters? Do you long for majestic mountainscapes and fast, sprawling forests? Do you simply wish to escape the rigmarole of your mundane, meaningless life? Well, Ulthuan is not for you. We guarantee you will not find a single eye-watering landscape here. Nor will you find an abundance of rich culture, stunning architecture, or luscious local delicacies. We can say with our hands on our hearts that Ulthuan categorically does not have the highest standard of living in the world. Nor are our citizens the most beautiful, intelligent, or successful in all these lands. You have our word, this is really no place for a city break or romantic getaway. Ulthuan, don't come here. So just out of a sense of completeness, perhaps we'll just have a quick look mm, at yeah, the yeah. other two Chaos Gods. And they are Slanesh, who is now the rebranded god of <laughs> family-friendly excess. Whereas before, it was very much seen as the sexy time god. Oh, so now he's more like play an extra hour of Fortnite <laughs> after your bedtime. <laughs> kind of god. Yeah. Cheeky. Yeah, one extra bit bag of Maltesers. <laughs> <laughs> bit naughty yeah they've really become the god of one more wafer sin mint (laughs) (laughs) so uh, slanesh has retained some of the lithe disturbing imagery which i think is quite good because they're gods of evil so they should be a little bit grown up so their greater demon is what's called a keeper of secret which is a a cross between a, a ww E wrestler, a bull, and a crab, <laughs> but with four arms. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to spend a day with the Warhammer Monster Development Department. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you could contribute something? No, just to simply ask if they're okay. <laughs> I, I bet it's harder than you think. You know, I mock them, but I bet it's much harder than you think to think of these concepts that are meant to stick around for a long time then you know what i mean they're not just kind of afterthoughts they're gonna be warhammer's a long-standing franchise right so yeah i don't mean to discredit them or belittle their efforts but try harder guys try harder (laughs) try try harder (laughs) so the keeper of secrets is the, the the greater demon then we move on to the lesser demons which are known as the demonettes which are effectively a cross between a uh, a woman of any stature and a lobster. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you trying to keep that one in, Chris. Uh, it's what he said, lobster. Picture this: woman, <laughs> Lob- lobster, <laughs> wobster. But they did try and dilute it a bit by giving them chicken legs <laughs> with a sprinkling of hen. <laughs> Um, oh, brilliant. And those are very much the foot soldiers of Slanesh. You then get into the demonic steeds, which are inspiringly called the Steed of Slanesh. Again, there's a couple of different versions of them. You've got what looks like a cross between a two legged horse, lizard. Here it comes. 
and teeter. And teeter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this just gets better and better. <laughs> that's the generic uh, steed of Slanesh. Then you've got one that's character models or generals or heroes ride, uh, if you'll excuse the phrase. And that is a giant snake with a kind of smooth anteater's head and six pairs of tits. <laughs> 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 oh, <dude. laughs> Have you ever seen those things on social media where it's like pick the month you were born in combine with this this and you got like a combination of different names yeah. uh, and, and titles it sounds like that it's like that's the criteria you get three columns in the department of monster development and what have you get three columns <laughs> and you get, a, B, and and C. You get like your name your month of birth your year of birth and each of those have like an animal or an asset or a feature assigned to them. So John, who was born in October 94, gets the half chicken, half woman, half a lobster. Uh, I'd love to have seen what else was in column C, along with six pairs of tits. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what were the other possible variables there? I, I really don't want to see that. <laughs> this beast is missing something. Or was it six, was it six breasts or six pairs of breasts? Oh, my mistake, it's six breasts. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, so three pairs, right. Oh, that's much more... Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah really. I, can, I can picture that now. I can picture that now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was looking silly for a minute. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, right, sorry, go on now. And then the beasts of Slanesh are called the uh, fiends of Slanesh, and they look like the anteater snake breast <laughs> animal, but with... Two pairs of backwards human legs. <laughs> of course they have. <laughs> oh, wow. Of course they have. Kill me now. <laughs> Just like, I can't walk forwards comfortably. <laughs> and most of those fiends wear what look to be assless chaps. <laughs> <laughs> And they're just constantly running away because the legs are on the wrong way around. When you read the description of these as a fan, you know, on your own, do you chuckle about them as much as when you actually just say it, like, out loud? So this guy's got backwards legs, six titties, and aardvark's head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is a bit of a hoot, but once you start reading what these things can do, they're actually horrific. A horror movie with even one of these creatures in it would absolutely terrify you. It would be like hereditary. It was just <laughs> the, the things they can do, like the steed of Sunesh, even if you take the one that looks like a two-legged horse crossed with a lizard and an aardvark, again, a bit of a laugh, but it snares you with its tongue, which I think is described as being up to 12 feet long, like an aardvark, so it'll just whip, out, whip you around. It'll pull you in and then will claw you open with its feet. Nice. So yeah, they're a laugh. That sounds pretty gnarly. Until you've conceptualized what it might be for someone of the Middle Ages to meet that kind of creature. Hmm. So you try and hit on one. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. Hey, baby. Do you come to this reality often? <laughs> Remind me again what this. So this is Zeech. What is it the god of? Sorry. Uh, Slanesh is oh, the Slanesh. god of excess. Of excess. Right. Okay. Originally, it was the god of depravity. Hence why they're all lithe and there are quite so many breasts on quite so many models. <laughs> Right, okay. Moving on from the opposite of the kind of sensuality of Sanesh, you've got the rotten wholesomeness of mm. Nurgle. Nurgle. Nurgle is very much the god of disease, but also despair uh, and hopelessness. So his remit being what it is, he has very disease-focused demonic legions. And do they like spew forth nastiness and... All kinds of goodness. You've got the vomit bile attack. Which, it, it's Ron Seal, it does what it says on the tin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the greater demons, the generals of Nurgle, are the great unclean ones that look like a Buddha statue that's been riddled with every STD you can think of. <laughs> Jesus. Mm. So they've just got lesions and chunks of flesh missing and all their insides are out. What, what did what did we, Dad used to call them? Uh, Grubles? <laughs> oh, yeah. All the their Grubles, Grubles are out. Yeah. <laughs> they could beat the Grubles. The lesser demons of uh, Nurgle are the plague bearers. Very much uh, human plus zombie, cyclops, unicorn person. <laughs> yeah. So it's a naked being, bloated slightly, 
who's got chunks of flesh missing and is disease ridden. They've got one eye usually in the center of their head and one horn above that. Wow. Hot. Interestingly, what they do is count all the plagues in the world. So they're constantly counting. Wow. So they're like administrators. They're documenting the diseases around the world. Why? Just simply so that they can go back to their god, who is a very avuncular grandfather figure. And in fact, he's referred to as Grandfather Nurgle, <laughs> uh, so that he can pat them on the head and say, well done. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> You've counted all the diseases. The, Nurgle's crew seem like the least popular, you know, the smelly guys mm. that you don't want to hang around with. Like the other three gods are hanging out and Nurgle, you can stay <laughs> in the other room, you stink. <laughs> And you're spewing COVID <laughs> all over the place. I think if they all got on, that would be true. But none of them can stand each other because they all represent, to some extent, an opposite mm. version mm. of each other. Okay. We'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> There's politics as they're involved between the gods of chaos. By miles. The steed of Nurgle is actually the load of Nurglings holding <laughs> up Palanquin. One of these chairs that have got mm. rods down the side. So you've got a big gang of Nurglings mushing forward with this rotted lord on a mm, on a chair okay. that they're the smallest but also the largest of the steeds the smallest but the largest yeah there's hundreds of nurglings oh, carrying each right. one okay, okay i think i'll take the frisbee of death as my steed <laughs> i take back all the disses i said about it the final element is the beast of nurgle who is called the beast of nurgle <laughs> the aptly named amen they're a cross between an enormous slug, a puppy dog, a touch of orc, and the kind of polypy grabbers of some type of sea anemone down its back. Jesus. My head is spinning. Well, wait till, wait till we get on to demon princes. Good Lord. So the one thing that strikes me about the Nurgle clan <coughs> is they don't seem particularly dangerous. I mean, most of them seem to be completely immobile from the fact that they're massively obese and rotten. Yes. No, I mean, you're not wrong, but also they're inevitable. Oh. They don't stop. They don't slow down. They're diseased, so they corrupt everything they touch. They don't have to be handy in a fight. They just have to fart on you. <laughs> and you're dead. Yeah. They fart on you. You get three different types of plague, can't move, and then a plague bearer comes up and stabs you with his uh, plague sword. Mm. Yeah, that's you, you, mm. yeah. But also, I, I think that more than any of the other three, Nurgle's power waxes and wanes quite wildly. So during times of peace and plenty, his power is not really that strong because no one's sick. But in the kind of aftermath of wars and during times of food blight Droughts. and what have you, yeah, his mm. power could almost be said to eclipse all the other three combined on a couple of occasions in Warhammer history, mostly instigated by Skaven. Ben, you'll be delighted Excellent. to hear that. Love a bit of Skaven. Mm. Skaven. Mm. Following on to Skaven, Skaven is a, unofficially the fifth chaos god in Warhammer lore as <sighs> was, and his greater demons were the vermin lords, which were these towering, towering rats that sort of looked like ballet dancers <laughs> in armor. Uh, with big rat heads. And they've got huge, like, ram's horns, don't they? Is this the horned rat? The great horned rat, yeah. The horned rat, yeah. So he's he's the unofficial fifth band member of the Gods of Chaos. He's the Yoko, is that right? He's very much the fatty bulger of hobbits, yeah. <laughs> kind of going against my reputation of ignorance here. I'm slightly less ignorant now because, um, Darren, you bought me the, the Skaven Battle Tome, which is... Yeah, which is a great read. So I, I knew of the... Uh, Age of Sigmar only. <laughs> ah, okay, right. Yeah. One thing I did read in that was that the horned rat, he or it only became, only came to being like towards the... Because he wasn't there at this original stage, this early stage in the Warhammer world, was he? No, I, I think it's important to maybe remind listeners that what we're talking about is roughly 5,000 years before the present day or the end day of the old world, the old Warhammer world. Uh, so Skaven don't exist yet, mm, mm. but will exist in the near future. And, and it's an interesting point because 
the Horned Rat is very much tied to Nurgle because his, uh, while Nurgle's purview is disease and despair, the Horned Rat's purview is ruination, so the destruction of civilization and the corruption of everything around it. This means that Skaven are very much like angry beast men because beast men who worship chaos undivided for the large part, they are very much the kind of unthinking, brutish, animalistic hordes that want to tear down civilization. So very much kind of fairy tale villains, mm. but I would certainly never say that to their faces. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that we're going to have several episodes on Skaven and their lore. So I'm guessing that something happens in the future that creates this horned one, which is why he's not around he or it is not around at this early yeah, setting. The the birth of the Horned Rat isn't really addressed in any of the lore that I can recall. The creation of the Skaven is. They're one of the few races where you can actually pinpoint where and roughly when they were created. Mm. And in fact, the center of their vast sprawling under empire is a city called Skaven Blight, which went by another name which was where they were created. So they're very much, they've never left home. Right, okay. Even though they're all over the world. Yeah. Interesting. But with Skaven, there are greater demons, but there doesn't appear to be any other form of demon. Right, okay. So the greater demons are the vermin lords. Yeah, you'd class them as greater demons. An interesting point, though, is that Clan Pestilence, which is the plague cult of the Skaven civilization, very much tied to Nurgle. The creation of diseases, infections, and, and in the games, you can actually field Skaven from that clan with a Nurgle army. So mm. they kind of share a cause. Interesting. Okay, so... They're in cahoots. So going back to our... Or chaos gods, then. Yeah, that's a rough summary of the, the kind of four and a half chaos gods that exist. An interesting point, I think when I, I touched on Beastmen there, is that while there are worshippers and followers of every single chaos god, it, to the exclusion of others, there are also armies and, and beings that uh, worship chaos as a whole, as undivided chaos, it's called, which really is just do what you want and praise the gods while you do it. Nice. That, that's really all they're after. I'm up for that. Yeah, I thought it might be interesting to have a look at the effect that the mortal peoples of the old world have on chaos gods and how they're sustained and, mm. and praised. I think we'll just stick with one because it's a topic that could span hours and hours and hours. So have a look at Korn, who's known as the, the blood god, the god of war, and his purview really is uh, rage, hate, and violence, martial prowess, and bloodletting, and the collection of trophies and skulls of your enemies. I'm guessing the orcs really like that dude. I think the orcs care about the orcs. They have their gods, Gork and Mork, and could give two shits about uh, everyone yeah. else. Mm -hmm. So Korn, given that he's a kind of martial warfare style god, very much in the, the vein of Ares, that kind of idea, is empowered by every single act of killing, of strength, of martial skill that exists. And that, at first glance, is objectively bad. However, because of the potentiality of chaos, any act that leads to to an embrace or a demonstration of those values that Korn holds dear, um, he smiles upon and it empowers him. So that includes honourable combat, valour, the defence of others. Any act that ends in violence or conflict uh, empowers him. So really, Korn cares not from where the blood flows, simply that it flows. So even if it's done for the greater good, you're saving someone else by killing someone. You've done a noble thing. It's not all about. It's not all about maliciousness and yeah, aggression. Corn's just in the background flexing his guns. He's like, Whoa, bring yeah. it on, Whoa. flexing his guns. <laughs> <laughs> and if you recall the last episode, I think it was you, Ben, who asked about is Cain linked to Corn? Mm. Cain, the elven god of murder, linked to Corn, the god of violence. The short answer is yes, because murder is an act of violence. And I had to wait a whole month for that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I would have made you wait longer. <laughs> so these everyday acts done by people who are ostensibly good provide a kind of background level of conceptual violence that ultimately fueled his birth. And with that birth, he was able to go out and gain followers directly. 
it was mostly the northern tribes from the Warhammer world. You're looking at the birth of Chaos Warriors. You're looking at the the birth of Chaos Knights and the Marauders of the North, the mortal forces of Corn. And because of his existence, he was then able to subsume the worship of uh, Cain, the elven god of murder, and we'll go through the various other gods another time, but any god that has control over combat or any form of martial exhibition feeds back into Corn at some stage, which means regrettably that those forces that are appearing against Corn not only have to combat his mortal followers and his demonic legions, but also their own acts of violence in defense of others or in opposition to Corn. So, you know, they're getting it both ways. You're, kind of, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, really. I mean, how, how do you slay demons in order to save your fellow human without any sort of violence? You, you can. You can. Strong words. Mm. Bugger yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. Get lost. <laughs> in Korn's case, I suspect it might be magic because as a god, he can't stand magic that isn't tied to an instrument such as a sword or an axe. Magic items they can use, mm. but they have no spell casters. They can't stand them. They kill them every chance they get. They're always the first up against the wall. Right. Which ties nicely to the idea of the opposition between the Chaos Gods and the politics of the Chaos Gods. If we start with Korn again, given that Korn is a martial god, he's very upright and militaristic. You know, taken to the nth degree. His direct opposite is Slanesh, the god of excess, who deals in pleasure. So those two things are held diametrically opposed in the Warhammer Chaos Pantheon. Mm. Now, if you can imagine perpendicular to that, you've got the god Nurgle, who's the god of disease and despair, and then Zinch, who's the god of magic and transformation. But with transformation comes hope, a hope for a better time, a hope for a better existence, a better environment. Which is the opposite of despair. Yeah, the despair of Nurgle and the hope of Zinch, again, are opposed in that pantheon. But then you've got oppositions between them. So Nurgle finds Corn to be bloody-minded and too focused on violence, and find Slanesh to be too tied up in how things look and feel, rather than the constant rebirth of life that the kind of destruction that Nurgle brings, because with Nurgle comes destruction, but he, what he destroys is then reborn as something else. It could be mm. algae, or bacteria, or slime, but it's still life. So all of the gods oppose all of the other ones, and they have constant contests, either with individuals or with armies or with whole legions, to see who's the best. And in the realm of chaos, each one has their own kingdom with various sites, and where those sites abut one another, there's constant warfare. So as a champion of, say, Slanesh, you can be sucked out of the Warhammer world and put into a demonic legion that's fighting against Nurgle or Zinch or Korn. And you can be there forever. If you're good enough, they'll just let you exist forever and ever. Wow. So your ability is also your curse. If you're good yeah. at that, they'll just own you forever. The ultimate goal of these warriors, these champions of chaos, is immortality as a demon prince. That's really what your, your goal is. However, not point not 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 one percent make it. All the others either die in the field or turn into chaos spawn, which Chris, the tables you mentioned earlier, in the rule books, there's tables you roll on to see which kind of animals you merge with time and time and time again. Oh wow. Jesus. That's ultimately the fate of most of these chaos champions. Death. Life is a chaos spawn until you die, or eternal glory as a demon prince. And demon princes really are the lieutenants of each demonic legion. So there are demon princes for each chaos god, but also there are independent chaos demons where the chaos gods briefly agree to raise one mortal up and to be a demon prince, and they'll then go off and further the kind of general background assfuckery that is <laughs> chaos. <laughs> So when, when you've got one of these demons that's fighting in the, the real world, you know, it might be a greater or a lesser demon or whatever, and he gets plucked out of the real world and dumped into one of these regional border wars in the Chaos Realm, is he still in the same form he is 
when he's in the real world, when he gets dumped into the warp? In general, I would say yes, they're portrayed constantly as being that type of being. Right. But it's, I don't think it's ever been described otherwise. I think perhaps they do retain that same look. Mm. Because it's very much tied to their sense of self, and even their sense of self is drawn from their chaos god. Mm. So to change what they look like could potentially be an affront to their god. And change their abilities and capabilities Absolutely. in battle. Yeah. You know, who they are makes them very good at what they do. So you wouldn't change it, otherwise you just pick up a newt and make it a badass, yeah. axe-wielding amphibian. <laughs> 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 Which I'm sure exists, right? Yes, but it has six tits. I think we're heading back to Slan territory. Yeah. Yeah. Slan and the Lizard Men, which, by the oh. way, the album was much better than their live performance, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> there's precedent for that, I think, in terms of uh, not changing what they look like, because there's a bloodthirster, one of the greater demons of corn, called Scarbrand, and this was a being of pure rage who got so pissed off one day that he attacked Korn, his, his creator, struck it with all his might, and all that happened was there was the tiniest scratch in Korn's armor. So what Korn did is picked it up, crushed it in its hand, so that all that was left was mindless rage, and then, if you'll pardon the pun, hoofed it out of Korn's kingdom, and it fell for eight days and nights before landing in an enormous crater. But its armor was cracked and broken and had the mark of Korn's fist on it. And there's a model for this figure and its armor does look like that. Wow. And it, it's never been changed, either in the lore or on the model. And who, who was that, sorry? That was a, a, a greater demon of Korn called Scarbrand. Scarbrand. And so where, where was this crater? It's a crater in the realm of chaos. Oh... Corn grabbed this greater demon that attacked him just in yeah. one hand, crushed him, and then threw him. And the impact made a crater and was like, Puh, that's what you get. Absolutely. <laughs> why was he so angry at Corn and why did he attack his creator? The story escapes me at the minute. I think he was just frustrated. He couldn't lead an army. Oh, no, a hole in knowledge. That's going to have to be at the start of episode three. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, we found a chink in his armor. Human after all. <laughs> Tell you what, Croggins, I'm fucking sick of war. All that violence and screaming and tearing victims limb from limb. It's bloody exhausting. I know what you mean. I've had it up to here with cleaning blood off the armor. And all that sodding marching, it would drive a fella mad it would. Don't they know us goblin folk only got short legs? Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong, Croggins. The physical growth we orcs experience from constant battle is great. Lovely little buzz there. Lovely. But sometimes I say to myself, Zug Zug, is that all you is? No, Zug Zug. This is not all you is. Here at Altdorf Greenskin Re-Education College, many just like you are discovering they are so much more than brutish killing machines. Situated in the heart of the Empire's capital, the AGSRC specialises in helping orcs and goblins find a new way of life, away from the daily rigmarole of constant bloody war. We offer a wide array of different courses, from pottery and massage to yoga and landscaping, allowing you to give back to the society you so mindlessly pillaged and destroyed in the name of Gork and Mork. With your help, I can finally put my axes to good use and become a lumberjack. Way, thanks, AGSRC. You're welcome, Zug Zug. The Outdoor Greenskin Re-Education College. Stop being a dick. Hey, Groggins, I'm going to be a fucking lumberjack. What do you think about that, you snotty green shit? That's right, you heard me. I'm getting out of here. Packing me bags and leaving. <laughs> So really, that's the kind of summary of the Chaos Gods and their pantheons. And those are really the being style creations of Chaos. You've then got the mutating effects of Chaos. And I think we looked at that last time on that image, mm. where you saw all those kind of geiger creatures kind of warping and mutating out of control. And very much that's the default position 
for anything that comes in contact with chaos if it's not trained or magically protected. Mm. It is a corrupting form of magic, and that's because it's unbalanced. It's an unbalanced form of magic. Mm. There are, in broad strokes, eight winds of magic, and I think we talked about, we touched on this uh, last Uh episode. (laughs) In combination, those winds of magic can be harnessed and used to perform any kind of transformative thing you desire. But not only do these winds of magic exist, warp stone, if you recall from Vermintide, the green glowing stone that the Skaven are addicted to, that is a physical manifestation of raw chaos. And again, it's an unbalanced conglomeration of metaphysical, magical Elements. And is that ever used by the good races? You know, can humans and elves and, and dwarfs use warp stone for good? Kind of harness that energy somehow? The short answer is yes. It's the single most desired thing in the Warhammer world mm. because it is raw magic. I think regardless of a being's intent, whatever you try to do using warp stone is doomed to failure. Unless you're, you know, a chaos person who is using it to further the idea of chaos. And that's simply because it's an unbalanced manifestation. It gives off Dar, the wind of dark magic. I knew Dad named you for a reason. Yeah, I was going to say, it's also what people call me. So (laughs) thanks, Games Workshop. Excellent. (laughs) But it's the thing that drives the skaven that's all they want they just want that because they physically consume it they eat it to give themselves a boost of magical power wow so while warp stone is it is this manifestation of chaos it's also the manifestation of all eight winds of magic merged together in an unbalanced form so it might be useful just to quickly run through the eight winds of magic as yeah. they stand because it, they're fairly central to most if not all magic that's used in warhammer and it'd be good to get a handle on them yeah. in terms of their impact totally let's do it so the first wind is called heish it's known as the white wind uh, and it underpins the lore of light magic everything to do with light magic is a bit egyptiany mm, lots okay. of pyramids to focus energy lots of robes and chanting obelisks obelisks that kind of idea The next one then, we've got Azir, which is the blue wind, and that deals with the lore of heaven. So that's the archetypal astronomer, as it were. But it's a, you know, an astronomer that can call down comets and lightning and obliterate armies and cities. Handy. Very handy. The lore of metal, which is the yellow wind. And there's a reason I'm leaving its name to to last in this sentence, because it's known as Chamon. (laughs) 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 very much alchemy transmuting one thing into another and if misused usually transmuting live things into dead things wow you've got gyron the green wind the lore of life think druids very celtic undertones to the whole affair the brown wind which is the lore of beasts <laughs> which they've named Gur. <laughs> They've named the lore of beasts Gur. Literally, Excellent. no vowels. G R R R. Something like that. Anyone who's seen the movie Beastmaster will know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Akshi, the red wind, which is the lore of fire, which, Chris, this is you now in Vermintide. You're a practitioner of the lore of fire. Ah, that's who that guy is. I'm not actually the lore of fire. I'm just a prophet, as it were. No, you're you're a practitioner of the lore of fire. Yeah, you're a wizard. No, you're from Grantham. I am. <laughs> is that where the brown wind comes from? <laughs> it's where the grey wind comes from. The final two, then, you've got Ulgu, which is the grey wind, is lore of shadow. Think Gandalf. Any kind of mystery, misdirection, traveling, that kind of idea. Oh. And then you've got Shaish, which is the purple wind, which is the lore of death, which is very cheerful. So is that what like necromancers would deal with, the purple one? Yeah, it's important to understand it's not necromancy. It's simply the lore of endings and death right. rather than undeath. Oh, I see. Okay. As I've said, these form the basis of all magic, and when they're used in perfect balance or in isolation, while still dangerous there's very little chance of corruption. And when all eight are used in balance, it powers effectively the high magic of the old ones. It it mirrors the effects of that. 
Now I say mirrors because I don't know if it's exactly the same. Because while the realm of chaos certainly existed while the old ones were still around and the polar gates were still whole, I don't know if it's the same if they're drawing the eight winds of magics through a kind of structured system within the polar gates to then be able to use high magic or whether they had their own system and high magic merely replicates that. So effect. is there an ongoing theme of the the winds of magic that they're always unbalanced and people are trying to capture the power, balance these winds and, and use the magic for themselves? Is that the kind of ongoing theme here with them? Any form of magic that is used out of balance against nature, in quotes, is powered by the unbalanced wind of Dar. How's that for a <laughs> sentence? I think that's what your wife complains about a lot. <laughs> I smell very unbalanced. <laughs> so, th- so creatures like the Skaven, Beastmen, Chaos Sorcerers, Necromancers, to some extent the Dark Elves, all their abilities are powered in large part by Warpstone or Dar. And if you recall, Warpstone is the unbalanced physical manifestation of Chaos which results in a big lump of dar on your desk. <laughs> With a flag in it. Plop! <laughs> <laughs> From dar. Love dar. Sorry, just going back to the, the high magic. Are there beings that can use high magic, which is what the combination of all eight winds? Yeah, you're, uh, you're looking at high elves and then the slan wizards of the lizard men. Right, okay. So it's... That, that's really that's it. That's really it. So the elves are pretty on it when it comes to the magic. They can be, yeah. Yeah. Mm. But specifically the High Elves, not the, the Wood Elves or the Dark Elves. The the Wood Elves use a variant on the Green Wind of Magic, right. the uh, Gyron. Right. Uh, and then Dark Elves, they effectively use Dark Magic, so it's Dar, the, the, the kind of Black Wind. <laughs> so there's a lot of that. <laughs> so Darren, we're obviously talking now about magic. Our, our magic, I'm assuming from what you've said, magic and chaos are quite closely tied and it does make sense to talk about the two simultaneously yeah well they come from the same source right okay in fact one is the source of the other sisters from other misters so i have two questions one where the fuck are the old ones (laughs) right they cause this shit storm and then where are they because if their magic if their abilities are slightly higher than that of high magic the combination of the eight winds then surely that's exactly what is needed to deal with chaos. So where the fuck are, where have they gone? They left just as the polar gates collapsed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they got in their crafts or through magic, just fled. Made a swift retreat. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, sorry, oh, sorry, I've just I've just realized I left the gas on. I've I've got to go. <laughs> oh that'll buff right out. That's fine. We're we're, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Just use some jugger buff. <laughs> <laughs> Not bugger Jeff. That's completely different. <laughs> bugger Jeff. E- episode title. <laughs> bugger Jeff. <laughs> jugger buff. Which one's funnier? Jugger. Yeah, they fucked off. And there was uh, some evidence that they knew it was going to happen, but left anyway. And what they did was they wrote down what their great plan would have been <laughs> on the golden golden plaques that uh, the lizard men. Yeah, well, we here's what wanna, we would have done. <laughs> yeah, we didn't we didn't want to we didn't want to dominate this realm anyway. But this is what we would have done. This is what you would have been in for. Actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Enjoy it without us. <laughs> they sound pretty deaverish <laughs> and brattish. Mm. Well, to be honest, their behaviour there's something one night standish about yeah. it. Re- reckless. <laughs> Right, okay, so my other question is a little philosophical. So, with regards to chaos, the chaos realm and everything that exists as a result of it, well, it it exists as a result of human endeavours and the emotions um, and feelings that that creates. You can't have one without the other. And so, surely... Because I, I, whenever I look at this and I hear the stories of the chaos gods and all of the demons, and I think, well, they are just hell bent on the complete and utter destruction of everything that is good in the world and all, uh, you know, the, all the good races—humans, elves, dwarves, whatever. But they need each other, don't they? I mean, humans probably don't need the chaos realm, but they need the 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 races within the war the the, the Warhammer world to 
continue to live so that they can create the emotion, which essentially is the, the fuel for the chaos realm. And so they can't be hell bent on the complete destruction of these good races. So have they got some sort of ulterior motive? Are they just there to stir things up, essentially? I think the short answer is no, simply because the old ones were traveling through the universe and they came across a planet and that planet was what became Warhammer World. It's logical then to assume that Warhammer World isn't the only planet and there are other life forms out there on other planets, all of whom have a reflection in the realm of chaos. In 40k, it's described that every soul is like a candle in the darkness and the warp, as it's known, the realm of chaos, is just a place of enormous light and swirling eddies and currents, all driven by how brightly some lights burn than others. Right. So a citizen of the Imperium in the 40k, they have a soul and that soul is represented in the realm of chaos as this light because that's ultimately where souls come from right okay in 40k there are beings known as the anathema and they are citizens of the imperium who don't have a reflection they don't have a, a soul in the realm of chaos and the description about them is it feels wrong mm. to mm. be around yeah, them. Yeah. you feel you know it, i remember reading about these guys in the the horus heresies they're like the the silent sisterhood they're it, yeah, the Silent Sisterhood are, are yeah. anathema, but by no means the only mm, ones, mm. yeah. They've got, like, no soul, as it were, and it's just not right, Yeah, man. It's just not right. It's like a void, isn't it? It just... It is, yeah. For some reason, in 40k, most of the anathema, in fact, almost all of the anathema, are women, which makes me think someone in the creative department was really <laughs> hurt at the time. It was. That is dangerous territory. Can it have chicken legs and lobster hands? <laughs> no, Jeff. <laughs> Jesus. Park it. Just, just this once. Park okay. it. Go and get some help, Jeff. Fuck's sake. <laughs> so what you're saying is that the relationship between chaos and the Warhammer races, it's not kind of symbiotic. It's not mutually reliant in that the chaos gods, the Chaos Legions, could completely destroy the entire Warhammer world, and they would be fine because there are, in fact, other worlds that are feeding the Chaos Realm with emotion. Yeah, I view them very much as a kind of parasitic right, entity. Right, okay. That makes a lot more sense. But, I mean, it's fairly straightforward to argue against that position, given that, say, for instance, you could take a view that Nurgle really only exists where there is a vector for diseases to grow. Mm. So he does need mortal beings to understand the futility of their existence and to be able then to corrupt and their physical bodies. And it's like you said bodies. before, he or it appreciates that where he comes along and decay follows, that decay ends life, which then starts new life. Yes. So he must be some aspect of it that understands that it has to keep kind of perpetuating life in order for it to continue doing what it's doing. Nurgle's reliance on life, it dilutes his godliness. He doesn't seem so powerful. He has a weakness. And I'm sure all gods do have a weakness, but it seems to be highlighted in Nurgle. It's like, yeah, but without life, you're nothing, Nurgle. You need living organisms to fester and and in fact but it's like darren said he's par he's parasitic isn't he? yeah yeah which which to me takes the edge off his godliness you can apply that logic to to all four of them look at zinch who if no one strives for anything and there's never anyone who tries to manipulate someone else and no magic exists mm. zinch disappears or in fact it's not even that magic exists that magic mm, is practiced mm, mm. but i think the important thing here is that within the warhammer world specifically the the chaos realm isn't dependent on the existence of the warhammer world because they're being fed the energies they need from other sources as well isn't it so they can be completely ruthless in their attack of the warhammer world and the races yeah absolutely mm. i think one of the thing that pisses the gods off completely is that they view themselves as noble <laughs> they view themselves as bringing gifts and if anyone turns around and rejects the gifts it's like good lord what temerity you have little mortal being squash <laughs> oh my me amazing oh my me <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your questions? It does. Great. It does. I feel enlightened. 
Yeah, so Warp Stone, as mentioned, is incredibly desirable because it is the manifestation of all eight winds, however unbalanced, and can be used to power, it can be refined. If you remember from Vermintide, the massive portal had a lot of Warp Stone crystals around it when we went to the, oh, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. north. It was green. It was green. The Poison Wind Globideers, the little oh, ratty yeah, guys yeah. that throw the green yeah, smoke grenades, that green smoke is powdered Warp Stone. Ooh. That's why it hurts so much. Uh, I did it, wonder. I was like, why does this hurt so him? much? <laughs> and now I know. <laughs> but because of its power, it's illegal in most of the Warhammer world. Its use is prescribed. And indeed, if you read into the fate of a city called Mordheim, that's where an enormous chunk of warp stone crashed down into the city, destroying it. But then the city was invaded by Skaven and other power-hungry groups desperate to try and get as much warp stone as possible. And as an interesting side note, they're re-releasing the Warhammer Old World setting in a couple of years' time, and it's set in the time where that meteorite crashes into the city. So it was a meteorite? A meteorite. Where, where did it come from? Well, this is the I was about to tell you. I forgot something. Um, oh. the, um. Because the Chaos Realm is the source of warp stone, when the Chaos Gates fell, when they collapsed, that was when Warpstone came into the reality of Warhammer. And the biggest chunk of it was the green moon called Moorslieb, which I think we've seen in a, a couple of games of Vermintide. Uh, you see a green moon yeah, hanging yeah, in the yeah. sky. Mm. That's just a big chunk of Warpstone. Wow. It's the evil moon. Evil moon. And during the end times, when they ended the Warhammer setting, when it came to its close, the Skaven crashed that moon into the lizard men's home country <laughs> take that lizard Shit. man <laughs> gonna drop a moon on green you. green on green oh no green on blue <laughs> green on blue <laughs> some green on blue actions yeah so forces of chaos and sorcerers and magicians whose ambition really outstrips the kind of wisdom of what they're trying to do Elves avoid its use like the plague and make their own crystallized version of the individual winds of magic, which is why you see so many um, gemstones and crystals on high elves in Warhammer uh, art. Yeah. Dwarves really don't use it, instead trusting their own reliable rune magic. They did create uh, a single uh, magic item including warp stone but that led to really horrific shenanigans is probably the best way to describe it and we can <laughs> talk about that in detail when we talk about the dwarven races but perhaps the largest conflict driven by the desire to acquire warp stone was the battle beneath cripple peak jesus which played a huge role in the rise and fall of Nagash, the great necromancer, and the ultimate creation of the entire land of the undead. And it was the, the, the mining, refining, and use of that that turned Nagash from uh, a mortal man uh, into a towering Lich King-style undead god, effectively. The, the only other thing I should really say is that Warpstone still pours in through the collapsed polar gates to this day, as it were, assuming that we were in the present day Warhammer world. So it's uh, the world is constantly being showered with crystals and little nuggets. Of, so uh, aren't the Skaven like drawn to that area, like the polar gates, if that's the case, and they want to nom, 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 nom some Warpstone? <laughs> Why don't they just live there? <laughs> Some nom nom nommy nommy nom nom. Some muncher buncher cruncher wobstone. <laughs> <laughs> I think they do try, and that's that's why there's constant warfare in the north. Mm. With Skaven armies trying to stake out a claim, you've got forces of chaos pushing back because chaos fights chaos. The largest section of Skaven Empire that's up there is Clan Mulder, <laughs> and they're the beastmasters. They're the ones that create the rat ogres and the, the kind of other monsters that go with the Skaven army. Is there a Clan Scully? There is a Clan Scully. No, there's not. S-K-U-L-L-Y. Get out of town. That's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> 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 we'll check out pictures of them and put them in the notes. This may sound simple and obvious, but hey, that's yeah, your forte here to learn more about this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's my party trick. That's your ammo. <laughs> Look at crispy thick. <laughs> but it, now, after two episodes and learning about the, the chaos gods and chaos and how it all works together, I see why this place is called Warhammer. 
Mm. <laughs> it's pretty wary. It's pretty chaotic. It doesn't sound like you can chill too much in this place. <laughs> no. You know what I mean? There's not much R and R in uh, Warhammer. No, there isn't. Yeah, just, it sounds it sounds like a massive disappointment. <laughs> 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 well and uh, thank you for listening to the second and final broadcast uh, of the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm done yeah, I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> well I think that's really it for today um, we've covered a lot of ground in a kind of patchwork <laughs> a patchwork <laughs> method there's, there's holes in this you could drive a truck through <laughs> um, but I thought since perhaps since we touched on the realm of chaos, we've had a look at what chaos means, the kind of four primary gods of chaos, and a cheeky little nod to the horned rat as the uh, other half. Big ups, horned rat. Half god of chaos. Uh, we've looked at warp stone, we've looked at magic. It's perhaps a good idea that the next episode we have a look at the ideas, cultures, and gods of the other races mm. uh, in a kind of similar patchwork half-assed fashion mm -hmm. yeah because i have a few it's the way we roll a few questions about that but i will definitely save that for the next episode thanks for that Dar. that was awesome chris what's your take on chaos then do you, is there a god that you would align yourself with man um here it comes chaos is here it comes it's pretty chaotic isn't it really there it is guys yeah. there it is <laughs> <laughs> here comes here comes the summary <laughs> here comes the climax uh. Chris, what do you got to say? Chaos is pretty chaotic. Um, Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. So six titted art box <laughs> with chicken feet and lobster hands are pretty chaotic. <laughs> I can see why the gods of chaos got their names. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's that's spot on, mate. And what gods, you know, are, are, would you align yourself with? Which of them appeals to me? You've got Nurgle, you've got Zeech, Korn, and Slanesh. Schmeagle? <laughs> Schmeagle. Schmeagle. No, Slanesh. <laughs> Schmeagle. <laughs> Slanesh, that was the one, yeah. I would have thought, initially, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old-fashioned hack-and-slash kind of guy. Love a bit of spilling blood, and I would have gone with um, Korn, but... It's Nurgle. I don't know. It? Nurgle. It's Nurgle. I knew it was Nurgle. It's Nurgle. Yeah. yeah. It speaks. It speaks volumes, Chris. I mean, the festering, boil-ridden, diseased. I th dude. I think. Yeah, that's, I that's think my your God. fiance would also agree. I think there's a lot of similarities there, mate. So yeah. Get out of my house. <laughs> 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 Just for some context, Ben is currently living with me at the moment. Uh, all right. So you were going to ask me. I was, but I'm not going to anymore. <laughs> <laughs> ben yes who do you worship out of those four godly chaotic i don't gods? know i kind of i quite like the idea of slanesh bit of a wrong and i think you'd like your quiff <laughs> that's because that's because <laughs> my, my quiff is a thing of sexual desire chris that's why it looks like the uh the winds of shimon have been through your, <laughs> your, thing. your quiff's looking a bit jaunty uh, i think i was standing behind nurgle when he let loose the winds of shimon and then permanently <laughs> solidified my quiff in this uh in this position i have rabies scabies and tetanus but my hair look has so look much volume marvelous and i have six nipples <laughs> <laughs> right we're done well thanks for asking i uh <laughs> i i originally thought slanesh <laughs> i thought slanesh was awesome um no one cares as i've gotten older i kind of uh slide between nurgle and um zinch mm. mostly because with nurgle because i'm hitting middle age Nurgle is fairly a familiar territory. <laughs> that's the mirror test. I can relate. <laughs> Excellent. All right, that's all from us. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to find out more about the topics we've discussed in this podcast, you can find all the references in the show notes. We'll be back again displaying just how little Chris and I know next month. Until then, cheerio. Sayonara. Bye. Bye.